I actually thought there was a lot of parallels between Ireland's victory and a little bit about how Limerick were uh, clearly the better team. The other side yeah. gets back into it and then they have to fend them off. And I actually thought Rory McIlroy was going to do exactly the same thing and it was going to be this triple weekend of, uh, of achievement where a team and what looks like the best team gives the opposition room to get back into the game. So to, to pivot to the hurling, um, why were Kilkenny so close to Limerick at the end when it felt like Limerick scores were coming much easier than Kilkenny scores? Oh, it, that's, I was looking at the stats afterwards that someone puts up on, on Twitter there and you know, you're know you kind of looking for, oh, that's the reason why uh, Limerick won or that's the reason why Kilkenny lost. But the similarities between them all, like what you said there, I found you know, you're jotting down your little notes then in your programme, who's scoring what, um, and all of a sudden Kilkenny would get their score like Richie Hogan score in the sixty third minute, and then you're kind of looking up and you're going, "How did they? How the hell did Limerick just get a point straight away there?" Like, yeah. As in, it just seemed to be the ease. It does go back down to Nicky Quaid. It goes down to the half forward line. Their movement is that's what I was just fixated on the whole day. Was looking at Gerald Hegarty moving a little bit left and then right and then left again. He's just going off. Tom Morrissey's just all over the place, and then Kyle Hayes the same. They they were they were unstoppable now. You would question whether why the Kilkenny half backs didn't stay to the outside of them and then pick them up as they're kind of coming over to meet them. And I thought there, was a, there wasn't as much communication there as should have been there. Like, even when you looked at when Clare played Limerick back in uh, the Munster final, um, sorry, it was, the, it was the group game that time. And you saw the Clare lads was actually getting Gerald Hegarty in a headlock and dragging him to the ground on puck outs. You're kind of going, it nearly needed that level of physicality where someone just took one for the team and just decided, no, enough is enough here. You're not getting the run of the park. But he was, what did, what did he win? It was something like there was 13 pockets hit down on top of me, one eleven clean. When you compare that to TJ Reid seemed to be kind of mauled and molested every single time the ball was hit down to him. He was still winning some of the puck outs, but how physically draining that must have been for him to win the ball with someone on his back and then to try and give off the ball. It just seemed like Kenny were exerting far more energy on the puck outs. I think that was the only stat that they kind of looked at and they went, Kenny, Kenny won 42% of their puck outs. Uh, Limerick had won 65 uh, of their long puck outs. I was thinking, yeah, it, it did made sense. Just the score seemed to come a lot easier for uh, Limerick than it did for Kenny. And yes, it was only a couple of points in the end. Like they, I, I definitely agree with you, David, that there, there is a sense that Limerick looked unstoppable at the weekend and they've looked unstoppable for years and yet Clare almost stopped them and Galway, Galway almost stopped them and on the scoreline when people look back they'll say geez that was a close game Kilkenny almost stopped them like is there and I appreciate they are absolutely one of the greatest teams of all time is there still an aspect about that though where we already have them on that pedestal and their reputation feeds into the idea that they're unstoppable as much as their brilliant performances do I always thought that they were kind of going in not fourth, fifth gear. I just thought right. that there was always another level. Like when Richie Owen got that point and, and you know, the small enough Kilkenny crowd that seemed to be there, um, all of a sudden then they hit five in a row. And then obviously for the last few minutes, then they just brought back Kyle Hayes and put him on the edge of the square, kind of going, you're, you look at, you, you might score a point or two here, but you're not going to bag a goal. Like if they'd won by five points, I think everyone would have went, wow, what an amazing team. Plus, you know, you, you do look at, Afterwards, they're reading an article this morning that David Reedy would barely made the final. Kyle Hayes barely made the final. Did an injury, whatever the hell those injuries might have been. Said the medical team did a great job, so they're probably after getting an injection there to try and get them through the game. Aaron Gillan didn't look 100. percent Peter Casey's only after coming on. Keen Lynch didn't play a minute. So that's what you're kind of looking at a team like that that have more gears to come. They have a, a savage bench and they have those under 20s that probably would have won an All-Ireland if they had Cahill O'Neill there this year. So they've, uh, no, I, I, as, as much as I think you'd like to say, yeah, they're coming back to the pot and they are, are to, the, to the rest of the group, I actually think that they could blow it completely out of the water next year. I, I think the likes of Keane Lynch, especially when it was him that was missing, imagine him coming back into that group next year, kind of drive the standards. Imagine him, he wants to be back out in that, that field, having that feeling in the in the 70th minute there, knowing he's going to win an All-Ireland. So... I, I can't imagine him letting up on any of the players around him. I can't, like, even their group. I, I, you hear so many stories coming out about them there the weekend. I was lucky enough to be in the GPA box uh, and you're kind of talking to different managers and they're all coming out with stories about Limerick but it, and just the, the envy of the kind of managers that are around there without naming names, kind of, that of they have their, their gym session night and strength and conditioning coach comes in and they're just all there. 
They're all doing exactly what they should be doing. Everyone's there. Everyone absolutely hammers it out the gym. Um, and then they head off home. And it's just a case of it's just running like clockwork that everyone is, they're driving such high standards. Every single player is driving around the next lad, the next lad. And obviously the lads coming in then, you know, the lads that are playing don't want to lose their position. So because they know they're on the crest of a, a, an incredible wave at the moment. And uh, Jesus, when you have players as motivated as that, it's that's a fairly unstoppable force. I think Shefflin was in the GPA box as well. But who was he shouting for? <laughs> I, Henry was there, and look, he's own Cody, his nephew, and he's very close to TJ and Adrian Mullen as well, and uh, obviously Richie Reid as well. So yeah, no, all the all his kids. We met him up in the skyline earlier on that day, and they're all uh, dressed up there in Kilkenny gear. Yeah, no, they're brilliant. And Deirdre was there as well. Um, talk to us about the goalkeepers, will you? Like what? What? Because there was various stages where. Uh, Nicky Quaid would let the ball run past him and you're like what's going on here and then it just looked a little bit kind of um, antsy in possession but it never it, it never resulted in a mistake after that it was just that like little extra second or uh, maybe he was maybe he was totally at ease in his environment it was like he was poking around in the back garden with the kids and um, the ball goes past he's kind of letting it in like pretending that he's letting it in and then all of a sudden he picks it up and pings a pass 70 yards so what was their respective performances like in, to your mind? Uh, Nicky Quaid, I would say, is on a par at the moment with Stephen Cluxon in his ability as a goalkeeper. I saw him in 2018. I was blown away by him. He kind of he's he has he has changed my whole thought process of of where goalkeeping and puck out should be. In that he's waiting. He's just he's ready with the 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 ball is literally up in his hand and he's the hurl just ready primed. Like it's not this usual, you know, back in. Jesus, even in my day, you, you took the few steps and you absolutely lumped it. He is just constantly looking and waiting like a Terminator there, just trying to see, right, where is the space opening up? But the players are making space and then he hits the pocket. A lot of the, lot, a lot of keepers, obviously, all over the, the country, would the keeper hits the ball and the players move to where the ball is landing. But the players are making the move and they decide where the pockets are going. Uh, with the space that they're creating and then he's able to pick it out but he he's able to control the tempo of the game he's not getting frustrated you never see him throwing up the arms going like again you would see in, in club games going well someone flip and move like you know he, he's just waiting and waiting and again you have Hegarty and Morrissey and they're moving over and back and it's uh, Jesus even even on the you know I said after the game on, on Sunday that's um, a scoreable free everything nowadays is that Everyone has their little gimmicks and their power plays uh, and so on. And there might be a score, but free there. And TJ took a free. So I'm kind of obsessed then looking at the, the Limerick forwards going, right, how are they going to set up on a score, but free? Because it's, it's an easy enough thing for uh, a, a forward line to try and know that what's coming up. And then they have those few, they're probably about 30 seconds to try and organise. Um, and then the first one, O'Donoghue and uh, Donovan pushed up right up into the half forward and created that bit of space. Now they ended up losing that one. But then the next one, then after TJ's free, they went spinal. And then the next one, then they went zonal. Uh, sorry, they loaded one side. And then the next one, next one was back to a spine again. You're kind of, you're constantly looking around, going, "Who the hell is organising this?" There's no one pointing. There's normally one person. Maybe your centre forward is is dragging everyone over because people aren't uh, awake to it. But they're just running like clockwork. They just move in in such unity that they all know what they're doing. And they're all able to create this space. And again, I don't know, maybe if, if Paddy Deegan and Mikey Carey had stood to the outside of the two half forwards, maybe then Nicky Quaid has obviously the intelligence then right and going straight down the middle where there's three lads versus Richie Reid. Um, he's, he's, he is incredible. And again, you look back in the highlights and he's running out with the ball. Gerald Hegarty is just slotting out to that kind of the... the the, that that kind of between the 65 is just picking up a ball and then he's driving over the bar. It's it's a nightmare for defenders because normally the golden rule is you follow your forward out to the 65 and you leave him off after there because you kind of think, well, after there, then he's probably going to get caught up and some midfielder is going to come out and he won't be able to be shooting under pressure. But Carol Hegarty only needs kind of a yard of space and it's straight over the bar from 100 yards. Even when David Blanchfield was on him in that for the last puck, he just threw him off like a rag doll and then slotted over the bar from about 80 yards. It's it's just sublime physicality. Uh, on Owen's puck outs, I just felt TJ was, he didn't have many options. The movement was 
wasn't great at all. The half forward line were far too close out to midfield looking for the ball. And that's an impossible ball for a goalkeeper to hit then because it's like a pitching wedge. You're trying to get it over the midfielders to land it down on, on the, the half forward line's head. But then you just have, like the Dermot Burns point, you have a half back who's just sitting ready that when he does catch it, he actually is out in the 65 and he can slot it straight back over the bar. They didn't seem to have as much cohesion in knowing right, where are we going with this? And and then, obviously, then he was route one down to TJ. The half forward line were out too far, so TJ was left isolated. So when the ball did break, you would probably Declan Hannon coming back, picking up. Barry Nash was obviously, was always brilliant anyway. Um, and then kind of, but, but when Wally Welch came on, it gave him the two kind of high towers there in the in the second half there. And he had two options there that he was able to go left and right. And, and Limerick found it quite difficult then for a while to try and get to terms with Wally Welch. That's why I thought Wally or John Donnelly should have started to give uh, give on a bit more a bit more range there. Adrian Mullins obviously an outstanding hurler, but probably probably moving him to midfield and starting there and starting one of John or uh, Wally Welch in the final. I'd say that was just one of the mistakes that Kenny made. On the Quaid puckouts, David, can any team sort of replicate at least the plan of what you're talking about there of the clockwork of the, the varying formations that are in front of Quaid I know obviously the hard part of that is being as good as Nicky Quaid is in terms of nailing it every single time just like Cluxon was in his heyday but is there parts of that element of his game that other counties can replicate oh everyone can everyone can but you you need an extremely patient uh, goalkeeper that's not just going to get peed off and then all of a sudden then just kind of just drive the ball and throw the hands up. You need someone who's extremely calm, patient with the forwards, understanding it's not working now. It's not working. That moment is not there. Now it's there. Now I'm pinging it out. Now I can see the movement. And then they're able to get the ball. Again, just small little things. Gerard Hegarty's not winning a ball and he has his back turned to Owen Murphy's goal where he's just, he has to do a full 180 and he's a back up, uh, back up him. Uh, it's the fact that when that ball is bouncing, he's already winning the ball half turned. He has his shoulder nearly facing towards other goal. So a lot of his size, it's in, it's, it's incredibly easy then for him to just get a ball on the bounce, turn, and he's already gone through the back. It's an impossible job for the back. But that's that's months and years of planning. That's that's John Kiley and Knurp being together now for for five years working on this. I'm sure they, I. I just say in my time, we would have worked on puck outs. We would have done probably about ten minutes of puck outs maybe three times a year where it was it was all about the break so i'd just lump down a ball we'd work on the break for 15 seconds and that was it and we'd blow up the whistle and we'd go back up again but there was no there's no movement there's no structure there's no one has a clue where they're going it's just a fact but then again you didn't have to when you had tj reed or henry or richie power or larkin or, or gertha there like there, there's, you didn't have to be working on styles or, or formations you just did what you did but it's uh it's completely it, it's it's the time and patience for a manager and a team to be able to go along and go, right, we're actually going to go along and spend a whole session on this tonight or we're spending 30 minutes tonight and again we're going over and going over and going over, going over before the match. Here are our puck out plans. Here are our options. And everyone's just drilling puck outs in. Because again, you know, you're 40, oh, Murphy has 42 puck outs on Sunday. Uh, Quaid had, I think it was 35. So you're going to, the keeper has the ball the most amount of time in a match. It's about respecting that and kind of going, well, we have to get these 42 and 35 puck outs, right? Like you have, you have to put time into it. And uh, yeah, the, I, I just think it's it's nearly boring or it's not, there's not enough meat to it there sometimes for managers where they're kind of going, let's just get on with it. I like just, just like even hair down in Westford, David Fitz had the Mark Fanning. He had an earpiece in him for one of the matches, one of the last matches where Mark Fanny didn't, wasn't in control of the puck outs anymore. David Pitts had the earpiece uh, and he was telling them where to puck the ball. You're kind of thinking, well, where's the autonomy there? Like that's, that's just one, that's only, that's only, was it two years ago? Now at this stage, uh, I think it was down below in Clare where again, I suppose that caused a bit of riff at the mo at that time, but it's, it's, it's to be able to go along and actually trust your players and let them do what they're doing. But that's from, from, that's that's the quick fix. Trying to tell the manager where, where to go. And sorry, just another thing, just on puck outs because it is one of my pet peeves now in life. Uh, it's also the kind of manager when you are doing puck outs, uh, the manager standing out around midfield, facing the goalkeeper, waiting for the goalkeeper to puck out the ball. And I would have had arguments with Brian over the you know down through the years. He's like, hit out the ball, hit the boys, the boys are moving. He'd turn around. They had all these like, statues. He turned around, everyone would start buzzing all over the place. And then he looked back and he go, Well, you hit the runners. And I'm like, There's nobody effing moving. 
and then there'd be you know the stare off would happen then two two ignorantly oh, sorry two headstrong men going at each other kind of <laughs> but it was just that was it it was the uh, you know if you want to see how puckouts are done stand down beside the goal and see what the keeper is seeing and all of a sudden then you'll see you'll soon see i used to kind of say it was like yeah, you know take me out uh the show like that the lights start going out like you were corner back because <laughs> you're back weren't you so that's that light gone and then he's after closing off the space of the half back so that's his light gone out and then you soon realize then there's seven or eight lights are gone the corner forwards are not even tuned into what's going on uh because they think the ball is too far away like so it's you're trying to then explain to the manager but sure if he's out of midfield it just doesn't work he doesn't see what's going on so that's why I look at technology as well, having having cameras behind the goals and facing out and seeing all the movement patterns that you can now obviously makes a big big difference. And I'm sure Limerick have all these uh, have all these uh, equipment there at, the, at their disposal. Would you wear an earpiece? Would you would you would you welcome that as a as a goalkeeper? You can't see it from where. Sorry, as a goalkeeper, would it? No, no, not in a million years would I want someone in my ear or in my head. I've enough. I have enough voice in my own head there talking to myself <laughs> about the stuff in life, so I don't need someone else there roaring at me because, again, you cannot, if you're a manager and you're pumped up in the silence, something's after happening, and then all of a sudden then you're there roaring at the goalkeeper down there. Like it, it, Again, you're, you're, you're talking about how a manager communicates with his goalkeeper. It generally is through a roar because that's the only way of getting your information to him. I do, over an earpiece is not the way either because you'll be just telling them what to do. And like I said, most goalkeepers anyway are extremely headstrong mentors anyway uh that's why they're probably in the goal they have that that's that, that in them that nature so uh no i wouldn't ever have an earpiece on um the the this the stylistic change of play that we saw from kilkenny this year was relatively significant it seems so is this team on a on a an evolutionary journey now and should we expect them to address the puck out issue given that they do seem to have addressed the style where they're at least thinking about being different from the original team that you were part of it looked like they were trying some short puck outs that you know to, to some degree of success uh, some issues where they were playing into um, difficulties particularly in that first half but yeah. at, at least they're looking for pockets of space and players in space as opposed to just Laurie and Ball down the whole game on Twin Towers in the full forward line yeah, just on the short puckers as well. Kikini went short 10 times and they never looked comfortable with the 10 times. And it was just, that's one thing. I think Owen's the best goalie of all time and always will be. That's just my own view on it. Um, his puck outs though were just that foot, a yard maybe above the head of Mikey Butler or Tommy Wells. They just, or they were at knee height. And then that creates, to use the panic. I actually thought we the, K- Kikini could have been done for hitting the ball inside the 21 a few times that he was, they were under hit and, and the player was inside so it's uh, there was that kind of panic then that Jesus you could get hit when you take that extra couple of touches that someone from Limerick is going to come in and absolutely nail you with that um, they, I, I think they're, they are I, I wouldn't say at, at any point there you can go God they're going to push on from that because like I said to you last week in 2014 we, we were all about this heads up hurling that we had changed our style of play because Claire had done it in 13 and we were going to do it then in uh, 14 we were going to start picking out players and so on and uh, it, it never really materialised uh, at all maybe I don't know for, for whatever reason they'd have to kind of stick at it but there'd have to be the first thing has to be is that is the same management team going back in place uh, again Connor Phelan's in there he's the head coach he's been there now two years but but having said that last year, he would have been on, you know, with COVID, he wouldn't have had a massive amount of game time with the lads out in the pitch as well. So I would imagine Connor would love to, yeah, take this on another level there as as coach and try and develop this. And it's about keeping on to the players. And and the great thing is, the very promising thing about Kenny is the fact that that whole team, I can imagine the starting team will be staying on next year. So then they're able to have a bit more cohesion with the with the players that they have and that they know their movement style and so on. But Brian looked back in that game, could look back in it ten times and he'll pick out little things there of people that just didn't match up to us. You know, I, I I can like again, like I said to you a few weeks ago that PJ Ryan two thousand and ten, he just felt his puck outs weren't going over the half back line. So that was PJ gone, that was him out the gap and uh you were Chaffee to Patrick in that two thousand ten as well, got held up uh, at midfield physically wasn't big enough for it and in Brian's head that was him gone. He as I said before, he he never says it, but in the off season, he'll know the different areas there that he needs to improve. He went for myself because I had longer pocket than PJ. Uh, you know, Michael Fenny was a, a physically bigger and stronger man than the likes of Chas. So that was kind of Chas. The writing on, uh, was on the wall there for himself as well. And uh, 
yeah, he, he'll find different areas there that he probably feels. If he stays on, again, you don't know. I, th- I think it's a his stock is pretty high at the moment from a lot a lot of quarters. The fact that he got them back to a final, that it was such a competitive final, that I suppose it's Limerick that was one that it, are regarded as one of the, the, the great teams now that maybe it might be a time that he might feel that he's moving on. And uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's hard to know. I'd say that's going to be, it's going to be an interesting, I'd say, battle in his head more than any other year, I'd say, just whether he does stay or whether he heads on. Because you think deep down he might want to leave it on a high, which this kind of is? It is. I know, like it is. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I kind of, you see articles everywhere that kind of they died with their boots on, died with their boots on, and you're kind of okay, yeah, that no, and they 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 fought to the bitter end. You're kind of going, that's still not where we're at. Like, as in, there's still moments there where you're kind of leaving Gerald Hegarty have the freedom of the whole park. Like, there's still areas there where you're kind of thinking, how the hell did this? How is this allowed to happen? Like, where was the where was the control of that half back? Like, where were the switches when they were scoring one thirteen from play? Like. What was happening there? Like, and it obviously made the move uh, at halftime, bringing on Wally, but it just still showed that they were a small bit slow um, in in their changes and in the kind of movements, in even in how they set up on the day. Again, like we said on on puckouts, I just don't think it's there yet, or the, at that level of attention, it has gone to that point yet. But um, it could be a good time for. But look, that's all up in his own head. He, yeah. he, nobody knows. I, I heard quite recently from a reliable source he had mentioned to someone that he was going at the end of 2021 and yeah stayed on in 2022 so that uh, yeah he, he could decide he could look at it and kind of go well TJ is still there the whole team is still there there still is a, there still is a chance there to get back to that stage um, I just uh, I, I think yes dying with the boots on it's grand and brilliant and all that kind of stuff but Kenny are it's not easy next year when you have Liam Cal coming in. Just say you've water the whole new management team. You've Pat Ryan down below with Cork. You've Henry in his second year. Uh, you know even Dara Egan in, in his second year down below a new manager in Dublin. It's going to be next year. It's going to be a fiery championship. But everyone is back up, gunning. And then you have the likes of Limerick there. I thought it was uh, fairly ominous there when you hear John Kiley inter- is interviewing goes, "We're going to enjoy the next few months and then be ready to go in January." Yeah. And go, Jesus, man, <laughs> twenty minutes. After. He was at uh, it. He was, yeah. The split season probably helps the team oh, going totally. for consecutive years. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Split season is amazing. Just from a, from from a personal point of view, it's amazing to be finished up and then know I can sit back, review kind of management teams, review looking at players, club championship, just to be able to have that break, complete break, spend some time with the family. I think for an inter county manager, it's a, it's an extremely attractive job at the moment. Just from the amount of that you're able to give absolutely your whole life to it for eight months. And then be able to enjoy some life, and and then obviously you're still doing your job, and the and the off season is still fairly chaotic, but it's not it's at a, at a more controlled pace. It's yeah. lovely. 